nanohub.org. You can follow along with this presentation using printed slides from the NanoHub. Visit www.nanohub.org and download the PDF file containing the slides for this presentation. Print them out and turn each page when you hear the following sound. Enjoy the show. We'll get started now. Uh, this is lecture 34 on uh, MOS capacitor. And today we'll be talking about uh, the capacitor's frequency response. Now we'll start with the background that why it's an important problem. And we'll primarily discuss about small signal capacitances. And you can immediately realize that if there is no current flow per se, physical current flow, electrons moving from one side to another, then there will be certain capacitances which will be present and certain capacitances which wouldn't be present. So that's an important thing. Uh, we'll talk about large signal capacitance for a uh, MOS capacitor. Large signal capacitance have some special features because the way charge gets redistributed among fixed charge and mobile charges. We'll see that, how it works. And then we'll conclude. So just to remind you where we are, uh, we have, of course, talked about equilibrium uh, band diagram, you know, and we are assuming this idealized case where uh, everything is flat. We have assumed at zero bias, all the vacuum level is essentially flat. In reality, that doesn't happen. We'll take care of this proper band bending and other things a little bit later, a few class down. Uh, we also talked about DC uh, operation. And you realize in DC there wasn't too much to talk about because generally the current flow uh, is not very much, right? Because there is this big oxide barrier. If you had to cal calculate current, then you would use thermionic emission by essentially looking at fluxes from both sides because there is a discontinuity in the conduction band. Uh, but of course, there is tunneling current these days that one has to calculate self or quantum mechanically. Today, let's talk about a small signal. And what I always want you to do when you read these things that follow the vertical, uh, vertical column and try to see a common pattern of how small signal is handled among all the devices so that any new device you can handle them easily. Now, this is a configuration. You will see on the left hand side, I have this blue gate, uh, gate region. It could be a metal, it could be a polysilicon, but here we are assuming it's a metal. The red is the oxide and P is the bulk region. Now, uh, in this case, we have just the gate and the body or bulk or substrate contact uh, over there. You can see a DC bias, which puts uh, the capacitor in a certain degree of depletion. Even in the absence of that little small signal, which is the signal coming from the antenna, let's say, uh, then you have a given DC condition, certain amount of depletion, accumulation, or inversion already present uh, in the system. And the small signal is trying to modulate around that DC or equilibrium point. And that has very interesting characteristics, as we will see. Now, in general, anytime you have a diode, you might uh, want to represent them through this parallel combination of junction depletion capacitances, and as well as, of course, the conductance G naught. Now you realize that uh, because there is no current flow, so I doesn't depend on V directly. So di dV, which is the small signal change of the current in response to a small change in the voltage, doesn't exist. So G naught, in principle, if you do not consider tunneling current, it will be essentially zero, no conductance. Now, of course, uh, these days uh, when you have very thin oxides, there are certain components to it, but that we will not get into in this course. Now, the only capacitance that is relevant is that junction capacitance. Why? Because you can see, if you look at the picture and the uh, uh, diagram on the left, that there are majority carriers, of course. In the blue region, 
the electrons and holes will come in and out very quickly. And also in the bulk region, the holes can come in and out very quickly. So the majority carriers are of course present. So in that case, junction capacitance must always be there. So if you look at the capacitance, this has this very strange form. And let's think about that for a second because this is an important figure that we will be discussing many times later. You will see when the gate voltage is negative, remember zero is a flat band, no voltage applied to gate voltage, uh, then flat band. On the left side, when you have negative voltage, what do you have there? You have accumulation of holes, right? So you have accumulation of holes, you see a flat region, regardless of your accumulation bias, you have a fixed amount of capacitance. Now, as you go in the positive bias, you can see the junction capacitance dropping rapidly. And that rapid drop happens when this is in depletion region. And then what something happens beyond that point that as soon as the inversion happens, inversion happens, the capacitance immediately goes back to whatever it was in the accumulation region. That's something strange, but the more important thing is uh, this, this only happens at low frequency. If your small signal over there, remember that signal coming from, the, uh, from, from your antenna. If that signal is low, how low? On the order of kilohertz or less. So very low. You really have to work at it. Uh, then it will go back as soon as the inversion occurs. It will go back to the original capacitance of CO. CO is the oxide capacitance, epsilon naught A, over D, D being the oxide thickness, you see. Now the transition point where it goes up back, that's a very important point. What should be that voltage called? That's the threshold voltage because beyond that point, the, the depletion changes into accumulation, right? Depletion is charge have been pushed back and accumulation where minority carriers, in this case electrons, have just gotten accumulated next to the rate region. Remember these are mobile charges through shock reed hall generation has gone back there. But the more interesting thing for most of the relevant frequencies, you know, megahertz, gigahertz, this type of thing, the capacitances you will see uh, in the capacitor, this type of capacitor structure is that it will not go back. It will stay essentially flat at the depletion value. And that uh, happens at high frequency. Now I want to emphasize it strongly. This happens only when it's diode. If you have a MOSFET, which we'll talk about later, that put those two additional contacts near the source and drain, this is not going to happen. The only characteristics you're going to see is a low frequency, regardless of what the frequency is, you see? So this is a very special case about diode that the high frequency behaves this way. So we'll start with by considering the junction capacitance only and then not worry about the diffusion capacities. I mean, where is the diffusion? Uh, so therefore, we'll not talk about that at all. So uh, let's talk about the total gate capacitance. Now, you can see the total gate capacitance here, of course, there is this red region is the oxide, and you can see the bulk P silicon, I have drawn it here also, uh, but the deep blue is sort of the inversion region and the green is a depletion, that how far the charges have been pushed back and exposing space charges. So this would be NA, right? Acceptor essentially sort of being exposed in the green region. Now, how would you calculate the capacitance? Well, the simplest way to calculate capacitance is to uh, take a derivative of the gate charge with respect to the gate voltage because Q divided by V uh, essentially is the capacitance. But we are talking about small signal because remember that capacitance is not really constant. It's changing at every point. So therefore, it will be a gate voltage dependent thing. So you can easily do that. But of course, I don't know the gate charge. That's the amount of charge I'm supposed to have in that blue top part. I do not know that. However, uh, one thing I can say that whatever that charge is, I do not know what it is, but that must be equal to the charge that I have in the semiconductor. What type of charge I have in semiconductor? Green region, we have fixed charge, blue, deep blue, that I have mobile charges. So this sum of these two pieces. Now the VG, this I have already discussed in the last class, that this equals to the band bending, pi sub S, 
and the oxide voltage drop q sub s divided by c c o c sub o do you realize how it comes about do you, do you sort of remember this is actually e ox the oxide field multiplied by x naught the oxide thickness now the oxide field you will always have to remember that whatever charge you have remember this poisson pill box whatever charge you have the electric field that is coming out that will be equal to charge divided by the epsilon of wherever the electric field is coming out so electric field is coming out in the oxide so therefore you will have a kappa oxide and epsilon naught and then, then you have one, one x, x naught on the top that gives you the c naught uh, you, you, you can look it up it is it's not complicated so you have that and using this relationship you can say well I cannot directly calculate it uh, CG, but let me try to calculate it, the inverse of it. So I flip it. So now dVg, dQg is what I'm looking for. And Vg depends on phi sub s, the amount of band bending, and the amount of the charge that I already have. If I take a derivative, you will agree perhaps that the rate Qs, as soon as you take a derivative with respect to Qs, that will become 1. So you will have 1 plus C naught on the second term. Now what about the first term? Do I know the first term? I already know the first term. Remember in the last class we talked about that as soon as you have a certain amount of band bending, then you know what the W is, how far the depletion width is. And from the W, you can calculate how much charge you have. Very, very simple. So you just need to connect it up in the last lecture. But if you give me that, let me, let me assume that you remember, then in that case, uh, I will call that the semiconductor capacitor. Semiconductor capacitor is that when I change the band in a semiconductor up and down, the amount of charge that comes in and out in response to that, that's the semiconductor capacitor. Oxide capacitance, you understand. And so the sum of these two will be the gate capacitance. So essentially that, that too, right? So I have CO, CO, which is the oxide capacitance and the C semiconductor. I have the semiconductor capacitance and those two are in series, right? They, have, they are one, well, one after another. And one thing you see that I have drawn a, um, a arrow uh, on that because this capacitance is not fixed, right? Why is it not fixed? Because as soon as they apply larger gate bias, then the depletion region changes. And you remember, right, that the depletion region is a denominator for the capacitance calculation. Depends on where you are operating it. And as a result, that capacitance in general is not fixed. However, you can still, if you wanted to know uh, the value for it, you could easily calculate it because these values are already known. Okay, from the last class. So go ahead, try to see that the Q sub S how it depends on phi sub s. How should it depend on it? Do you remember? Square root of phi sub s. Remember, this is just a junction depletion. Didn't you have VBI minus VA square root of that when you had talked about diode? So it's that VA being replaced by phi sub s. That gives you the depletion. So that's what the degree of the capacitance change and charge change you will have here. Now, I want to use this information a little bit later. So I want to define this quantity M, the called the body factor right here. M is by definition that M is equal to 1 plus the semiconductor capacitance divided by oxide capacitances. Well, wh why, why should I do that? You can immediately see in a second. Uh, first of all, do you agree that Cs is 1 over kappa naught n to Wt? And, and then correspondingly, Co, that is in the denominator, so the x naught gets flipped back. So therefore, you have that particular expression, the x naught value and the WT value. The WT will depend on the voltage at which you are operating it. Why am I interested in that ratio? What does it give me, this random definition? Well, not completely random. You can see that if I wanted to know what phi sub s is in a series connected capacitor, right series connected capacitor do you agree with the statement below that it will be given by c naught divided by c naught plus cs multiplied by vg do you agree with this because capacitances when they are in series how do how do we add them up 
This is the inverse of capacitances. We add them up, right? So therefore, you will have to see that that's how this one is. But then you can immediately realize, look at the definition. The definition is one, m is 1 plus c s divided by c naught. So you can see if I divide c naught top and bottom on the denominator, then I will have, I will pick up this factor called m. And now this m in general is voltage dependent. So in principle, I shouldn't really, it's not a very good quantity. In practice, it turns out that the m, value of m, is on the order of 1.1 to 1.4 in most modern uh, transistors. As a result, you can see the phi sub s will be like a 40% or 60% less than, or 40% or 60%, yeah, less than the gate applied voltage. You apply one volt surface voltage, well, it may be 0.5 volts that's coming across the surface. So that's what this is trying to tell you. And we'll use this later on, you'll see. So let's talk about small signal capacitances with these basic definitions in place. Now, this is in accumulation, right? Accumulation, I have what type of voltage I have applied? A negative voltage. Negative voltage brings in negative charge. And so uh, there's negative charge on the gate. And so it will pull in positive charges. And positive charges are holes. So the holes will pull, pull in close to the surface. You can see the Fermi level is flat but the band has bent so that the difference has been reduced. So I have more holes and that's the red holes you can see close to the surface. Looks like a parallel plate capacitor, right, doesn't it? So it will essentially, the majority carrier charges will come there. And so the accumulation capacitance for the junction, I'll just have the oxide capacitance and be done with it. Now, it really doesn't matter what voltage you are in, right? Of course, the magnitude of charge is very different depending on the voltage, but the charges are same distance apart and change of charge as a function of change in the voltage is the same. You may have a huge amount of DC charge sitting there, but if you are just making a small change, let's say 0.1 millivolt, uh, 0.1 volt change in the gate bias moving up and down. So the extra amount of charge you bring in is exactly the same. Therefore, the capacitance in accumulation is essentially independent of bias, accumulation bias. Now, in principle, the accumulation region, if you were born 30 years ago, then perhaps you could ignore it altogether. It turns out that these days oxides are only 10 angstrom, right? Very thin oxides. And the red region, well, the red region, remember W accumulation inversion we calculated the other day, we just looked at, there was this exponential green region. We compressed it into a rectangular region, do you remember? And that had a certain amount of depletion. So I cannot really, these days, completely ignore the extent of that red region. So then what do I do? How do I calculate capacitance? One way you could say, I will just take the centroid of the red charge and centroid of the blue charge and make that one my new X naught and be done with it. Well, that wouldn't really work because the dielectric or the, uh, the dielectric constants of the oxide and semiconductor are not the same. So therefore, there is a trick. Anytime you have, let's say you have a parallel plate capacitor, you have air, let's say, and then some other dielectric in series, two materials. What do you do in that case? So of course, you can do a complicated calculation, but there is a very simple trick, you see? you can put some virtual charges there, the negative, and uh, you put some negative charge there and immediately take it out in the next point with that red dotted line, right? Because these are two parallel capacitors in that, and then you can write it this way. Because then the two blues will make one capacitance that has only one dielectric. The two reds will make another capacitor that has only one dielectric in between. And these two are essentially two capacitors in series. And so you just put down the formula for two capacitance in series. Do you remember that, right? Capacitance in series is the inverse you have to add and then flip back. So that's, that, that's it. And you can easily calculate it. So the bottom line I want to make, that only if, only if the oxide thickness is reasonably thick, 
no, reason, even, even maybe five years ago, you could say that. If it's reasonably thick, then uh, you would only about think about the uh, capacitance being, uh, the junction capacitance being exactly equal to C0. But these days, if you go in the lab and make a measurement, it will be a little bit less because of the charge that you have in the accumulation region. So this is something very easy to understand and you should be able to do it. That trick, that trick these days is often very useful because the gate oxide these days have multiple layers among themselves. They start with a thin layer of silicon dioxide, then put a, they put a hafnium silicate or hafnium oxide, then they have a polysilicon. So when you have a stack, gate stack they call it. When you have a gate stack, if you use that virtual charge that in every interface you put that plus and minus up and down, you just can cascade them easily and you have the entire capacitance in one shot. Okay, so now junction capacitance and depletion is the part where this is rapidly plunging this junction capacitances with the positive gate bias. Let's see how it works out. Well, again, it's not very complicated because you apply a positive bias. If you apply a positive bias, then you induce positive charges in the gate. So it pushes back any positive charges in the body or in the bu bulk and therefore it pushes back and therefore the red region here is these are exposed charges right in a exposed charges and the holes have been pushed back and so that you do not see it in this close to the surface well then you can again do this if you wanted to calculate the capacitance right because again you see that if you wanted to know that how much charge, if you change the blue charge a little bit, remember first of all this is DC, first is DC, that I have a bias. Then I am changing the frequency a little bit, moving up and down. So first of all you have this blue region and the red charge already present, even if before you bring in any charge, uh, bring in any small signal voltage. Now when you bring in the small signal voltage, the blue moves up a little bit and the red on the edge of it or the far end edge of it, there it moves out a little bit. And so, therefore, the charges are sort of one end on the gate and the other end on the far edge of that red region. Therefore, when I want to look at the total capacitance, I essentially look at the blue uh, arrow and the red arrow on the edge of those two regions. And then you, you see the virtual charges I have put in. And again, I can easily calculate. I can easily calculate the capacitances. You remember W, how to calculate W, but this one is actually very simple, has a very simple formula. And let's see how it works. Do you remember this equation? Sort of, I think. The, which one is the oxide, uh, fear, uh, potential drop in the oxide? The first one, you see first term after VG, that is NAW, that term, that term is the electric field that is coming out in the oxide multiplied by X naught. Oh, you could, you could have cheated and see whichever X naught occurs in whichever terms, that must be the oxide, the oxide drop. And this W squared, you remember, if the charge is a constant, integrate electric field is a triangle and the potential is the W squared part of it. So you have that. And I told you before, right, you can solve for W from here. It's a quadratic equation. Everybody can solve it. And if you solve it, you will get an equation like this, Vg minus V delta 1 plus on the right hand side minus 1 and V delta is a constant. And what you can do therefore, remember if you go back in the top, top equation where I'm trying to calculate the depletion capacitance on the top, what is the only unknown I see there? I know X naught, dielectric capacitances are, the constants are known. Only thing unknown over there is W, right? And I have just calculated W. So therefore, this I can put back in. What happened to the plus 1, by the way? You can see there is a minus 1 sitting on the bottom. So that took care of my minus 1. Now, do you see, as you increase the voltage, that it will go down as a square root of gate voltage, right? As you start it, and that's what you see in the depletion region. That as you increase the gate voltage, because of 1 plus Vg divided by V delta, underneath the square root. Therefore, it goes down. I mean, that it will go down, you understand, right? Because the charges, the depletion is getting larger and larger. So your capacitance have to go down. That it should be square root of Vg. 
that of course comes from the calculation. Okay, so this I can do up to what point? Till the point I do not have the inversion charges coming in because then that will change the ball game one more time. Now in inversion, what will happen in inversion then? So we are talking about low frequency in the inversion region where the oxide have capacitance have decided to go back to the original value. Again, do you remember that I have those green charges over there? These are inversion charges that were generated through shockley reed hall because these are majority carriers were depleted and the minority carriers were thermally generated. Okay. Now we are talking about this time charges, the small signal bouncing charges back and forth on the top of that blue region, right? That's why when you apply extra, little extra bias, the original configuration, the deep blue, green and the red, those are DC, DC conditions, whatever uh, you are, you have biased it in inversion and then you are applying a small bias. And so if you do it small enough, uh, uh, sort of uh, slowly enough, then you can see the way the charges will respond will, will be this two yellow regions, those charges will respond if they could. And in that case, again, you wouldn't worry about it, right? Because these are parallel plate capacitors. So that's what you have, C0. And you will expect a constant low voltage independent of the applied DC bias. Uh, if you wanted to account for this width of the green region, then how would you do that? That's the same as the accumulation one. Uh, no, nothing, nothing special because you have this inversion capacitance and the inversion capacitance will go as W inversion, you know, in the last class we calculated that, how much it is, how much is it by the way? It's very small, 20, 30 angstrom, not very much, right? Very thin sliver of charges that moves just underneath, underneath the gate going from one end to another. So it's a very, very thin region uh, that allows you to do this. So unless C0 is, is relatively big, uh, you didn't, don't really worry about this very much. Okay, now that's, now first tell me, what frequency, when somebody says low frequency, what frequency is determining this? What is determining the response of these electrons, these green electrons forming? This is the rate at which they can go back in the conduction band, right? They have to be generated. Now what is the typical range of time constants in which charges can be generated? On the order of a? milli to a microsecond, right? In silicon, that's whatever generally recombination time constant or generation time constants are. So, unless you are doing it slower than that, the charges that are building up on the top in the accumulation re uh, inversion region, it cannot respond. So, the immediately you see that if you have few traps, if you have few traps and your surface states are very good, then it will take a long time and you have to go slower than that so that the green charges can respond. As a result, low frequency is really low and very, very low. Most of the time, it's very difficult to see this. You have to do special things uh, in order to see this. Now, many times people will define an equivalent oxide thickness because they don't want to carry around this inversion capacitance and the oxide capacitance separately. And many times these days, also they have uh, people have other high K gate dielectric rather than silicon dioxide. So it's a very important quantity that you will see in the literature all the time, equivalent oxide cap capacitance. So we have already said that in an inversion, I have this inversion charges and therefore I have the inversion capacitance because the charge is shifted a little bit uh, away from the junction and therefore this is less than C0, right? We know that. And I have shown that here in the figure by explicitly drawing that red region for high gate voltage lower than minus, lower than one. I have exaggerated. It's not that horrible. You will not sell any uh, computer if it were this horrible. Uh, and then I just told you about the, how to calculate the capacitances. Now many times people don't like to carry around these two capacitances and then calculate them separately 
because for a given technology, the degree of inversion is known. X naught is sort of known. And so therefore, people want to call it an equivalent oxide thickness, EOT. And that is sort, some sort of effective oxide thickness that already accounts for this charge pushback or charge uh, extent of the charge in the accumulation region or in inversion region. And you can easily try to, if you go home, uh, equate the CG on two sides, you will see the effective oxide thickness will depend, of course, on the inversion, how big it is, and of course, on X0. But only trick is that the oxide dielectric constant and the semiconductor dielectric constants come as a ratio. Do you know how much is a semiconductor dielectric constant, like in silicon? 12 or so, right? So 12 or so. And uh, oxide, silicon dioxide is 4. So you can see that this is already you get a factor of one third from here. But these days we are replacing it with high K gate dielectric, right? We want to change it in a high K gate dielectric. So therefore, the oxide capacitance, like in hafnium oxide, it will be 20. So that will be larger than the semiconductor, semiconductor capacitance. The more polar the material is, the higher the dielectric constant. And so these days you are trying to really build it up. And I'll explain that why, why you would like to do that. Okay, now what about high frequency? Low frequency, you can see the charges uh, you have, let's say, on the, um, on the blue region, that tip of that charge is moving. And at low frequency in the green region, you can see the tip of the charge is moving also. There is something wrong in this figure. What's wrong? This figure, the charges are upside down or this is, I should have an electron concentration, it's upside down. So I should have flipped that one. But anyway, so I, at low frequencies, that black regions you can see on the tip of green and the blue, that is what should have responded. But if I don't give it enough time, if I move things up and down very quickly, then you can see I do not even give it time to get to the inversion region. So therefore, what is going to do? The only thing it has in uh, option, it has to match the charge balance immediately. Now, the only option it has, the depletion regions are more compliant because they can move in and out very quickly. So instead of burdening the green region, the inversion region, asking for it to help because it's slow enough, cannot help, it will ask the red region to push back a few extra holes out because it's a majority carrier. So it will push back the holes. And as soon as it push back the holes, you can realize that what's going to happen, that essentially the inversion region, although it's biased in inversion, but as far as the small signal response is concerned, as if it's not there, because it's not useful, it's not helping. And so therefore, the capacitance will look like as if it is still in accumulation, you see? So the DC bias point is being set by all three charges, the green, blue, and uh, red, but the AC response in being governed by the green and the edge of the red region. So that is how, that's why it gets clamped at high frequency. High frequency, as I said, uh, more than a few kilohertz would be more than high enough frequency. And this is why I spend so much time by repeatedly telling you the importance of majority carrier dielectric relaxation, how much? 0.1 picoseconds or so, right? So it will come in and out that quickly. Well, if you're trying to push your input frequency faster than that, even the majority carriers cannot do it. But we are not there yet. Chances are we'll not be there. Uh, and then, of course, the time constant is this, uh, the minimum time constant that you need is the shockley reed hall time constant. So this distinction is very important. These, none of these things happen in PN junction. Right? So it's very important to sort of you follow through the arguments in a series linked, linked set of ideas. Uh, otherwise, you'll be thoroughly lost. Hopefully not now. <laughs> okay. Now, let me just graphically just try to illustrate that point one more time. That at low frequency, the blue and the green charges respond. 
at high frequency, only the edges of the green, red and the blue respond, right? Because the majority carriers, the holes can move back and forth very easily, and the green ones cannot. In reality, the, the, the curve that you see on the left-hand side is what I just explained to you. In practice, if you'd go and make a measurement, these are not complicated measurements. Uh, students do it in the lab all the time. This is standard measurement in electrical engineering. And you will see that the capacitances that you'll see is more like the one shown in the right. And uh, you'll see mostly the, the, the blue line at a high frequency. If you don't do anything special, there is certain tests like a ramp test that allows you to get to the, uh, the low frequency part, part as well. Now, do I, uh, have I convinced you that that point where the things change is called a threshold voltage, right? The red, red region from inversion to, uh, from uh, depletion to inversion, that to change over point is the rate point. So if I give you a problem to ask you that did give you a CV, CV uh, characteristics, that what is the threshold voltage of this particular transistor? What is the, for example, the doping of this particular capacitor or particular capacitor structure? You should be able to do all that, right? Because as soon as you know dip, uh, threshold voltage, you know the W, how much W is, remember 2 phi sub F, and related to VG, you can calculate that, and from 2 phi sub F, you can calculate the how much doping you have in the substrate. So this is actually telling you everything that you need to know. And also, what about the blue point? That's the flat band voltage point, because, because that is the point where accumulation is going to depletion. So that's when the bands become flat, and it changes from one side to another. So in real characteristics, you will also try to see that. And that will give you, so quote unquote, the flat band voltage when the bands are flat. Now, the tricky part is the large signal response, and this requires some thought. So large signal response, how, how have I treated, or have, how have we treated large signal response before? You just did it in exam. Uh, we have done it by charge control theory, right? Generally, we have done it by charge control theory. But in charge control, charges were really moving. Remember, I integrated the diffusion equation, minority carrier diffusion equation, and thereby, I got the charge control equation. Now, did I use that when we were talking about metal semiconductor junction? We didn't, because it was all majority carriers. Majority carriers, of course, there's nothing, no minority carriers to integrate and therefore no charge control equation. You can see the same is going to happen here. I cannot use charge control directly, right? No minority carrier here, no electrons flowing. So therefore, I'll have to do it in a slightly different way. Let's see how it's done. So I'll be switching things between zero to one, and you can see that instead of the small signal tilde, I have a sort of a digital signal going back and forth, going zero, zero, and zero, and one. I'm sorry, that tilde shouldn't be there. That should be deleted. Uh, I'll delete that. And generally, if the signal is large, I can see that as soon as the switch switches, as soon as it switches, the switching is very fast, going from zero to one, very fast, right? Gigahertz range these days. So the switching must be even faster. Gigahertz is one cycle. And so it's even faster than the switching is. There's no hope that the green inversion charges will be able to respond, no hope. And so primarily the depletion charges will have to take care. And I want to explain to you the most important thing is that when you do high frequency, digital, then that's the red curve. But the red, that red curve is different from the blue curve. Both are high frequency, but in one case, do you see the, what the distinction would be? In one case, the green, and I'll show you in the next slide, the green, even green, wouldn't have time to form. Because in the previous case, when you're looking at small signal, there was a DC bias. The DC bias brought in the blue charges and the green charges, everything was sort of ready. On top of it, when you bring in a small signal, 
Then the red and the blue, they sort of responded in the back. Green was there because that is the DC bias what gives you. Here, however, you are getting things from 0 to 1. There was no green to begin with, no electron, no inversion charges to begin with. So it was all accumulated. And so, therefore, when you bring in this X, all when you charge, sudden change the voltage, the red one will have to take care of everything. It will have to push back out all the way up. And therefore, this red solid curve in the capacitance is very different from the red, the blue one that you see. Up to the inversion point, same. Beyond the inversion point, one case you have the green, another case you do not have the help for the green. So that's make the important distinction between large and small signal. And so that is what I wanted to say. The small signal, you have a green present and that gives you the blue line in the capacitance, but a large signal going from 0 to 1, right? Abruptly switching, you can see on the right hand side, I do not have any green. It didn't have time to form the green. And so therefore, the entire depletion region essentially pushed back out all the way out and therefore the capacitance is actually much lower. Again, you can calculate this and this is the same capacitance because you do not have the green. So as if the depletion is continuing and the depletion is continuing. So therefore the same curve, the rate curve, even beyond the threshold point continues to be square root of 1 plus Vg divided by V delta. It continues on the same curve, only for large signal. However, this is not going to stay, right? Going to stay like this forever. Why not? Because these charges are going to, going to relax. So you see, initially you have this. Now let's say you go from 0 to 1 and stay at 1. Now as you stay at 1, the minority carriers are gradually building up. You, need, you give them time, they will gradually build up. And as they are gradually building up, it doesn't need the help of the depletion charges anymore. The depletion charges are gradually coming back. And as a result, this will, capacitances will gradually change from one to another. You see, there is this little animation. Uh, let me try to show you one more time, just to you understand how this transition takes place. Because it will start a deep depletion, Right? And then it will gradually, if you just hold it to one volt, then after a while it will go to the low frequency one at the end. How does it go from one to another? This is how. Take a look at the right hand side, charge on the right hand side and see how it's working. So as you, as you hold it at one, hold it at one, then you see gradually the green will come up and the red will pull back and the green, when the green is fully there, well, your capacitance is a low frequency capacitance. And, and eventually, the frequency will respond between blue and a red, and that's when it will relax back to the low frequency value. Now, okay, so correspondingly, as I said, that most of the time, if you do this with pulses and other things in a high frequency, uh, this is the real, uh, I, the left hand side is ideal and the right hand side is in reality what you are going to get. Now, the one point I wanted to make was that if you do a pulse, then you will have deep depletion because depletion is continuing even above threshold. That's called deep depletion. If you just do the pulse a little bit uh, ramp, then you will have a little bit like this, right? Because you are allowing time for the charges, the green charges to build up. If you do it even slower, I'm sorry. If you do it even slower, then essentially you will have a DC bias and on top of that you can have a capacitance. So these three cards you need to understand. Now let me end with this. Everything I told you is very good physics, but in reality, in real devices, Many of these things may not apply, but you understand, I want to understand this before you understand the more traditional things. Most of the time, when you talk about a capacitor, here is the capacitor, charges move in and out of the body contact. What charges? These are the holes moving in and out. So 
to the body contact as you need it. And the response time you will have, if you want inversion charges to respond, the generation time is Ni divided by 2 tau, let's say. And so this time constant will dictate what is low frequency, what is high frequency, right? Because you need, if you want to do low frequency, it means simply means you want the green charges have time to accumulate. And so in that case, the dividing time is tau, which is the generation time, kilohertz or so, let's say. But in real devices, in a MOSFET, something else is going to happen. What is going to happen is that as soon as you bend the bands by applying a positive bias on the gate, instead of requiring the electrons to come from the body back contact and then thermally generated in the inversion region, remember the bipolar junction transistor, NPN transistor, what happens when you push down the base contact? Electrons from the emitter immediately get into the base, is that right? That's right. So in that case, these electrons will come from here. It will come from here in a nanosecond. So anything that I have told you about deep depletion, about, uh, you know, this high frequency, low frequency response, you will not see this. Only thing you will see is your low frequency response in the sense that here the low frequency is a gigahertz because charge can come in and out very, very fast. Now, if this didn't happen, your computer wouldn't work. Because if you needed a millisecond for the inversion charge to form, you type, you're typing a word document and every time you hit something, the transistor is getting into inversion and you say, dear sir, and on every letter it's taking a millisecond, well, you're not going to write the letter. Uh, because, you know, every time you hit a key, you're inverting a bunch of transistors. And if every transistor requires a millisecond, you need a million of them then of course uh, nothing, your uh, screen is not going to tell you anything at the end of the day. This doesn't happen of course, because in a real MOSFET structure, the majority carriers sort of come from the source and drain and immediately helps you to establish inversion. And that is how this time constants play out in actual devices. Now, even in the capacitor structure, I'll leave it as a homework. Uh, meaning that it could be a suggestion for the exam also, that if I shine light on that capacitor structure, then what would have happened? Would it help me in some way? And how would it help me? So try to answer that question. Let me summarize then. Uh, although the current flow in the, through the oxide is very small, uh, but the, uh, and therefore the most important thing is junction capacitance. All these things I did, you know, accumulation, depletion and all those things, all junction capacitance, no diffusion capacitance, no conductance, nothing like that. Now the high frequency MOS capacitor and low frequency for a diode structure, two terminal, is very different. And as a result, we need to really understand how it works. And the deep depletion is an important consideration because there are many places where, in fact, your automotive and many applications, people do use this type of diode structures for capacitances, high voltage capacitances, power electronics, people use that. So in that case, these notions of deep depletion and other things, those are also very important that you need to account for. Okay, thank you very much.